Welcome back to Beyond Four Walls. I'm David Dworkin, President and CEO of the National Housing Conference, and I'm joined today by Robin Hughes, Chief Executive Officer of the Housing Partnership Network. HPN's affiliates include the Housing Partnership Fund, Housing Partnership Ventures, the Housing Partnership Insurance Exchange, Framework Home Ownership, and the Charter School Financing Partnership. Highly regarded as an industry leader with 35 years of experience in affordable housing and community development, Robin possesses deep expertise in advancing public policy at the local, state, and federal levels. Prior to joining HPN, Robin led Abode Communities, a top 50 affordable housing developer nationwide and premier provider of environmentally sustainable affordable housing in California. Robin received her master's and bachelor's degrees in public administration from the University of Southern California and certification from the executive program in community development at the Harvard Kennedy School. So welcome Robin and thank you so much for joining me. Hi, David. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited about our conversation today. Me too. So um, let's start with uh, something you said in um, a blog post recently. We need to disrupt the status quo to raise the bar for what constitutes success in affordable housing and connect creative ideas to transformative outcomes. There's a lot to unpack in there, and which is great. And um, so let's talk about um, what you um, mean by that. Um, first of all, disrupting the status quo. Um, you don't have to convince me that the status quo needs to be uh, disrupted, but tell me a little bit about what, how you see the status quo and what we need to be doing. Thanks, David. You're going to start with a tough question first. Um, so disrupting the status quo. Um, over the years and most recently and this role as the head of HPN, you know, as I talk with people around the country, I recognize that for years and years and years we continue to be on the offense, or excuse me, I should say defense, uh, defending our housing programs, defending the system that we work with within, uh, trying to get minimal resources to support uh, the production and preservation of affordable housing, uh, and sort of maintaining the status quo. And what we really need to do is have transformative system change to ensure that we have the resources in the sector to address the enormity of the problem, whether it's the housing affordability piece or the homeless piece. So what can we do as a sector from a policy perspective, legislative perspective, land use perspective, to, instead of scaffolding around the edges, really create a disruptive change or transformative change so, so that we have a system that is more streamlined, that is more efficient, that is not under-resourced, but has the resources needed to really fill the gap that we have in terms of our overall housing supply. I also think it's the way that we think about and measure our outcome. We're very good at measuring production units, household serve, loan volume, things like that. But it's also the social and economic and individual impact that we need to demonstrate as a sector to show that these resources are desperately needed to address the problem. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. We spend um, a lot of time arguing for resources by saying this is how we spend your money. And and that's great because you want to be able to say that. But I think what's much more powerful is saying we spent this money, this is what we built, and this is what resulted from it. And if you want more of that, then we should do more of this. Yeah, recently at one of our member meetings, one of our members talked about her conversations, whether it's at the state legislature in Congress. And she says, for years, I've gone to talk about what my organization needs. She goes, of late, it's really shifted to talk about what the residents in our community needs, what resources they need to ensure that they have access to 
uh, adequate housing to ensure that we reduce that home ownership rate, especially along among BIPOC uh, home buyers. Um, so it really is more focused on the people, very people-centered outcomes and impacts um, is where I see this sort of how we measure impact and talk about impact in the future. Yeah, I think that's really important. And, and this is really informed by your own experience. Um, you did not grow up in the uh, upper middle class suburban community that um, I had the privilege of growing up. And tell me a little bit about that, how how you got here and, um, you know, about your roots. Yeah. Thanks for that question, David, because my, um, you know, lived experience in early childhood and growing up definitely impacted impacts how I approach this work in community development. So I am a native of Los Angeles. Um, very early in my childhood, um, my mom moved her six children, including me, to public housing after separating from my, my father because um, that's what she could afford, uh, working a minimum wage job at the time. And public housing provided that safety net that we needed as a family during that moment in time. Uh, and I can definitely remember some really great uh, um, engagement or, or playing with my friends and my family and the communities. But I also have very vivid um, memories of how deplorable the housing conditions were. And I could also remember just things not ever being repaired or fixed. So you can imagine as a kid how um, unheard or unfelt you, you, unheard you felt as a kid. Um, so while it was that safety net, it definitely wasn't the environment that my mother meant to have for her young children. So we were fortunate to uh, ultimately move into a small house that just so happened to be my great uncle's home uh, after my mom married my stepfather. And that, again, was that safety net we needed in terms of housing. That was in South L.A. And in South L.A., I continue to see and experience disinvestment. Uh, in the community, the lack of resources that were available um, to the residents of South LA. So as I ventured on not too far from home to the University of Southern California, I knew that I wanted to work in a space that was about giving back to or investing in communities like the communities where I grew up and engaging with the people in those communities, I think was really important. So it's really that experience that uh, ultimately led me to the space of community development. And um, sort of early in my career, I was then fortunate enough to find the affordable housing and community development space. And, uh, and that was with Abode Communities, then the Los Angeles Community Design Center. And I knew that um, I had found my, my mission in life in terms of a career opportunity as well in a space where housing is such a transformative part of, of people's lives in terms of economic and social mobility, economic stability, kids having opportunities. So it's really this journey that keeps me very excited and committed to the work that uh, HPN does today and our members do in the communities where they, where they serve. Well, and you had quite a career at Abode. Uh, how, how long were you there? So I was the presidency of Boat for 26 years, but I actually started there as a young project manager uh, uh -huh. and uh, grew up in the organization. And, you know, I think back on the opportunities that were most exciting for me and inspiring for me. And definitely it was the affordable housing and the opportunity to go out and talk and meet with residents and see the impact that uh, the affordable housing had on their lives, especially the lives of children. When we saw kids doing, you know, better in school, social and behavioral issues being addressed uh, because they had now had a safe and affordable place to uh, call home and a place to do homework and a place that had resident services to support it. So um, while the production is a at Abud Communities is a wonderful accomplishment. I am really proud of the resident services program that we were able to build there. So how did that happen? I mean, you start at an entry-level position. Um, you're, I'm assuming, fresh out of college. You are in this organization, and then over the course of the years, you re rise to become, I'm assuming, their longest-serving CEO. That's Pretty impressive. I and mean, most people do not have that experience. What 
What about you? Uh, what about a boat made that happen? Yeah, so when I started at a boat as a project manager, I had uh, the fortune of working with uh, someone who is a close friend and mentor, Anne Sewell. And uh, I think having her as a, you know, leader, boss, uh, mentor meant a great deal to my career development. And I would recommend that for anyone in the sector is finding oh, that person who is going to support them and, and their professional development, career development. And um, it, I think it was really my hard work, dedication, commitment to mission that then mm -hmm. allowed me to go very deep into the organization. And ultimately, um, I, I'm going to be honest, David, I, yeah. I think I always had my eye on the executive director role at Abode, at Abode Communities and just really worked hard towards towards that direction. And in the 26 years that I was at Abode Community as a CEO, I probably had five different jobs, and that's what was mm -hmm. really excited about that opportunity, that as the organization grew and expanded, I had an opportunity to go from being a work, working executive to, um, I remember the day when I said, oh, I'm no longer affordable housing developer, that I'm running this social enterprise that has architecture development, property management and services. And then I was able to evolve to an, uh, a CEO with a strong CEO that could spend more time externally. So I was able to do policy work at the local, state, and federal level. So it's truly that evolution of the job, the growth of the organization, the um, constant ability to grow, develop, and, and overcome new challenges. And that increase in production over time, I think, is what kept me there during that that long tenure. And, and not all of uh, our colleagues have that opportunity to grow in that space and to have that multiplicity of experiences within an organization. It's so valuable to organizations, as you know, um, to, to bring that to the table. And yet um, you ended up at HPN, now bring coming in from the outside, um, with that perspective, um, tell me about that. Cause that's quite a life commitment to an organization. What about HPN spoke to you and said, you know, cause I know you were on the board there, um, mm -hmm. that said, yeah, this is, I have had a lot of different adventures here at Abode, but this is my next big adventure. So there are very few things that uh, could have taken me away from my uh, abode, sweet abode. It was my home for, mm -hmm. for many, many years. And uh, HPN really drew on what I was looking for in my next stage of my career. Um, it has allowed me to take my 35 years as a practitioner in this affordable housing sector and take it to this national platform that is doing so many amazing things with our members. So I had this opportunity to do, um, well, not directly do affordable housing production and preservation, but to have an impact on the sector uh, through bringing more resources, through policy, through lending, through programs that we deliver. At the same time, I have this wonderful opportunity to work with this a network of very creative, solution-driven practitioners to work more broadly in the sector to bring about system change, which is really exciting. And then I also get to take this national platform and work on housing justice and racial equity, uh, both within um, the organizations of our members, within the communities they serve, and within the sector more broadly. So it's this... Um, multi-discipline, multi-approach, systems change, ability to impact uh, um, affordable housing and community development at a national scale that, that really drew me to HPN. And of course, um, it is our board, our members, and our staff. This is the most creative, intelligent, curious group of people who are working collectively, collaboratively, to bring about, um, to scale work, to scale productions, to bring about change in the sector, but always very focused on 
the human-centered aspect of this, on the people that are impacted by the work that HP and, and our members do. So um, it's been such a thrill to be in this role for this 18 months. Um, David, you mentioned that um, I was on the board of HPN, and in addition, I was the board chair for HPN for four and a half years leading into this role. And I had that perspective of the organization, but being in this role for the last 18 months has definitely given me a deeper understanding and perspective of the impact that HPN in our, ne in our network has on the sector. What was your biggest surprise? I mean, you're going from the board position now to into the nitty gritty. What struck you that you was like, oh, I did not see that one coming? There have been multiple ones, but the one that I, um, the one that I was most drawn to early on or surprised by early on was, is the multifaceted nature of HPN as an organization. So HPN is very much known for the peer exchange work that we do with our members um, at the C-suite level, as well as uh, across topics that are top of mind for our members. And it is this uh, peer exchange with is practitioner driven that leads to all of the other multifaceted things that HPN does. So whether it's our policy work or, or the innovation work that happens within HPN, the creation of new social enterprises with our members or programs that our members are delivering to, to their residents. So I was really thrilled with the depth of programs and services that HPN offers its members and the fact that it was or is so, so diverse in terms of what we're able to do. I think the second thing that I've been very pleased by, David, is this opportunity to also recreate myself as a CEO. Uh, you know, again, I grew up at a boat communities it, it, um, and evolved into the CEO role. Here I had the opportunity to land in an org a very mature, seasoned organization with a strong uh, executive leadership team, a very strong board. And I got to think about what my leadership style, my approach, my way of being a CEO could, could and will be different uh, at HPN compared to how it was at a boat community. I, I love that. My um, my wife is a couples counselor, and one of her mentors often says that um, most of us will be married to three different people in our lifetimes, <laughs> and 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 for about half of us, it will be the same person. And um, and I think that's really true. We evolve as people. We revo evolve in relationships, and. Um, and we evolve in our work life too. And so I think, um, you know, what it sounds like at Abode is you had this experience of having a variety of different jobs, even as the executive director um, and how that evolves. And then um, you come to HPN and I love when you said, recreate myself as a CEO. Tell me more about that. What does that mean for you as a person? So, um, you know, my my role here as the, as the executive leader is still very much grounded in the things that I value. So I value the the intellect uh, that my executive team brings or my staff brings. I value collaboration. Um, I am a very compassionate leader. Um, I'm a decisive leader. Um but I also listen, um, and, and I'm a curious person. So those things are you know, foundation of value things that come with me um, as a CEO. Um, as a CEO for HPN, um, while I have had and will continue to have a deeper focus on, um, or deep focus on operational issues during my first uh, portion of my tenure at HPN, this platform really gives me an opportunity to be upfront, national, focused in my leadership. So that uh, in and of itself is, is very different, but also how I manage and lead this organization and, and, and guide the staff. Uh, again, having a very strong executive leadership in place means I have um, sort of CEOs of different components in my organization uh, and people are running those really well and they know how and when to come to me when they need my support. 
So that is, a, again, an evolution of where I was at, at Abode Communities, but I get to scale it in a different way uh, here at uh, HPN. Um, leading leaders. Was, leading, and I was going to even uh, mm -hmm. stand on that with my board and the membership. Again, I was on the board of HPN, so I was mm -hmm. a leader among leaders. Mm -hmm. And now as the CEO oh. and, and, and the executive and CEO and president and CEO of HPN, I get to be to have this wonderful opportunity of being a leader of leaders, which is really a, a, a shift in the way that I have engaged as a CEO. Well, and you bring a lifetime of experience to that, so it's really valuable. Um, just going back to Abode for a minute, um, when you look back on your career there, and we kind of make it as personal as possible, what's the one project you worked on that really touched your heart, that made you feel like, wow, I made a difference. And um, this one, you know, I'm, I'm going to remember for the rest of my life. So I think it is a combination of developments, mm -hmm. one that I did very early in my career at Abode Communities and one that uh, happened years later. It just so happened to be in the same neighborhood. Um, so there was a property that uh, we purchased in the Wilmington area of Los Angeles. And um, if you recall the movie New Jack City, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, this building was, uh, uh, was exactly like that. It was due and its name was New Jack City. So major gang, crime, drug issues going on. The conditions were horrible. Um, Unfortunately, um, you know, half of the units were occupied and just were in horrible condition. So the opportunity to transform this existing building, existing community, and to our, our property and to a vibrant community. And when people were able to come back and be part of this community, um, it was, was a pretty significant change for me and change in the work and how Obode communities approached our work. We created a community facility in that space. We created an a early ed center in that space. So it was way beyond housing. It was interesting as we were planning the community facility, we realized that we were, because of the issues in the communities, we were making everything interfacing uh, to the property. And it was one of those aha moments in a meeting where we're like, we have to make this external facing. We have to face the community and bring resources to the community. Um, so that's one of my early projects that I was so incredibly proud of. And, you know, it continues to provide, I think it's about 150 units of affordable housing for in that community. About a decade later, we were selected along with Mercy Housing to do a public housing redevelopment right across the street from this development. And to see what had now been, you know, a vacant lot, um, well, I should say vacant 24 acres uh, for, 10, uh, for 10 years, so a decade, you know, transformed into this amazing community um, at the scale that we were able to do and the variety of housing and community space we were able to provide. So those two developments were about um, neighborhood transformation in a way that was sensitive and engaging to communities. So you can imagine that my story that I said or told earlier about living in public housing, to be able to be part of the transformation of affordable housing in a way that is sensitive to community, in a way that engages community, and then ultimately delivers the highest quality of affordable housing and community assets. Uh, it was really such a privilege to be able to work on that project. Right, and you know, you talk about how you grew up and what you do now, and um, you mentioned the importance of listening and being decisive. And I think people often think that you have to do one or the other, but in reality, People need both. They need to be heard, um, but they also need to depend and count on their leaders to be decisive. How do you balance that? You know, what do you, how do you, you make that reality for your team? Yeah. 
So I have been very fortunate to um, have around me really strong leaders with deep expertise. So that was out of both communities and here at HPO. Um, as well as, you know, deep bitch, a deep bench of staff who are subject matter expertise as well. So I, and, and my staff reflects this back of me, I am, you know, a really good uh, active lister, so listening intently, curious, so asking questions, um, and leaning into that knowledge and expertise uh, to make decisions. And it's it's a patient process uh, that I've learned over time, but also an effective process. Uh, and it's one that um, I do attribute to having strong leadership. So, David, that was a really sloppy answer to that question. <laughs> no, is it? Well, you know what? It is not a neat and tidy process, is it? It's, <laughs> it never is. Um, the uh, You mentioned um, the Peer Exchange Network. I wanted to come back to that. Sure. Tell me a bit about that. It sounds, sounds great. So... Uh, peer exchange is in HPN's DNA. It is what uh, the organization was founded on and what continues to inform everything we do today. So the way that peer exchange works for HPN, um, so remember, we have about 100 and 110 plus members. Our members are affordable housing developers, both uh, multifamily rental and home ownership as well as CDFIs, community lenders. So that's who makes up our, our membership. And we have members working in uh, you know all 50 states. So through Peer Exchange, we focus on communities of practice that are sort of executive level, C-suite level positions within our organization. So we have communities of practice for our CEO, CFO, CEO, head of real estate, and those communities of practice really focus on challenges, issues, solutions, innovations that our members are working on within their organizations or their communities. Uh, but we also have cross-cutting uh, covers by peer exchange as well. So whatever is top of mind, whatever the critical issues are facing our members, uh, we have opportunities for them to we present opportunities for them to come together and exchange knowledge and information. And the peer exchange happens in two, on two platforms. We have two um, meetings in person each year, the spring and the fall. Uh, and it's not a conference. It truly is all about peer exchange uh, within these communities of practice and across these uh, topics. And then we have about 14 communities of practice come that we do virtually. Uh, throughout the year as well. So, David, we just had our member meeting about a week and a half ago in Atlanta. Uh, we had uh, just over 220 members participate, uh, about 80 of our member organization. And the number of, of members who came up to me that expressed how much they are they enjoyed the peer exchange, how much they learned during that opportunity, and the things that they wanted to bring back to their organizations as a result of the work. So it could be around production or lending. It could be around business operation. We do a lot of work around racial equity. We do work around policy. Um, so it really is this opportunity to learn from one another, to collaborate with them, one another, and it is as I mentioned earlier, it's what leads to other things that we do at HPN. It informs our policy work, the programs that we do on do in collaboration with our members, our lending activity are all informed by this peer exchange uh, engagement. Oh, that's a great segue to come um, to the racial equity question, and you know, I'm going to be meeting with Richard Rothstein and uh, his daughter, Leah. I've done a lot of work on this around uh, color of law, how um, the policies of the federal government, you know, really contributed to a lot of the um, damage that we've seen in communities across the country. Um, the But how you get into something and how you get out of it can be very different. 
um, you know, we uh, one of the, the challenges of redlining are the scars left behind by redlining. We don't have to have laws that require redlining in order to have to continue to face with the face the impact of that, right? And one of the projects that you've been working on is the Housing for Healing initiative, and and I think that's you know part of what we're challenged with, right? Is how we how we make a difference because just saying we're not going to do these bad things anymore, not enough. So David, um, I'll address the housing and healing, uh, but more broadly, I want to talk about what HPN and our members are doing around uh, addressing racial equity mm -hmm. uh, in, in our organizations, the communities that we work in, and our policy. Um, back in 2019, at one of our member meetings uh, here in Los Angeles, actually, we were challenged by a community leader who uh, just so happened to join us for that meeting. Uh, in this conversation around community engagement, she said, I'm not hearing anything about race and how this network is addressing racial equity uh, in your work. That resulted in a steering committee formed by HPM members to come together to, to begin to have, again, this peer exchange opportunity to talk about what our members are doing to address racial equity, housing justice within their communities. Um, this steering committee then met over a 18 month period. Um, I, was I, I was still a member at that time. I was part of the committee and um, really had some challenging conversations, courageous conversations about what it might look like to have a national organization like HPN take on and its network take on and take on racial equity. What came out of the steering committee were four things. One was uh, the creation of a racial equity committee as part of our governance. So we now have a governance committee. The other was the creation of a BIPOC CEO affinity group. So our Leaders of color could come together in uh, in a safe, courageous space to uh, address leadership and racial equity and how how we are working in our communities. Third was to continue to do peer exchange in the space of racial equity, and the fourth, which is a big one, was our racial equity pledge. Mm -hmm. So this steering committee drafted a statement and a racial equity pledge, and asked our members to sign on to this pledge. The pledge consisted of four key levers or elements that our members are committing to. One is addressing how um, our sector looks, making a commitment to racial equity among our sector. So are we diversifying our boards? Are we diversifying our staff? Are we diversifying you know, how we engage in, in the community? So that was a big one. The other was spending. How are we spending our resources? How are we making investments in the communities and working with BIPOC-led organizations or BIPOC-owned firms? The third was around policy and using a racial equity lens to advance policy at state, local, and federal level. And the, the fourth was really about how we're engaging in communities. How are we working how our members working in communities and doing it in a way that is done through a racial equity lens. So that's a that's a really big commitment. To date, we have about um, you know thirty nine of our members who have signed on. Another fifteen who are um, in you know using it as a way of beginning their journey mm -hmm. or evaluating how they adopted. And then the others are on different stages of their racial equity journey, and mm -hmm. we will continue to work with them. So HPN is utilizing this platform, our peer exchange, as a place where we are advancing racial equity in the sector to address issues like redlining. We're starting to see that in the insurance sector right now. Mm -hmm. Literally, insurance carriers deciding not to uh, cover affordable housing or permit affordable housing or asking questions like, you know, what percentage of your tenants are either Section 8 or um, tax credit qualified. So we're beginning to see these issues and then coming together as a network to say, 
what do we do to bring about changes and make sure we're not um, replicating or we're not seeing policy replicating that red lines or excludes communities of color in particular? And I think that, you know, we certainly in my case, I had this sense of redlining in the context of their, the federal legal redlining that was outlawed in the 1968 housing uh, or in the Fair Housing Act. And yet we actually still see redlining in a lot of different insidious ways. And one of the most insidious, I think, is algorithmic redlining where it's built into these models. We never get to see it. In some cases, the people who do it are completely ignorant to what they're doing. Um, it seems to make perfect sense to them. And then when you take a step back and you look at it, it's like, whoa, that's, that, that is a problem. And, um, and it's, uh, and yet its impact is still devastating. And, uh, we, we just have to pay attention. You know, it's one of those things that if you're not looking at something, you're not going to see it. Mm hmm. And you said it, David, we see it in big and small things. We see it in, you know, appraisals and what happens mm -hmm. when an appraisal or appraiser comes to a, a household that just so happened to be occupied by a person of color and how that impacts um, that appraisal. I was talking to a gentleman um, who said, you know, my wife and I um, basically have the same debt, income, you know, use of credit, and yet my credit score is higher than hers because she is a woman of color and I'm a white male. I mean, we see these uh, ways in which the, these algorithms are resulting in exclusion and discrimination and, you know, pure, pure racism or red line. Yeah, and the algorithms are written by people and they bring their biases to the conversation and they bring their biases to their work. I mean, that's part of human nature. But if you don't have the processes in place to really root that out um, and to protect against that, it's it, it's self-perpetuating, really. Yeah. And David, that's why it's important to have organizations like ours who are bringing awareness to issues like this. And, you know, your members, our members are working to address these at the, you know, the regulatory level as well. Um, you know, I hope as we look to the future, we can think about how to interrogate policies uh, and from a regulatory standpoint, result in racism, discrimination, redlining, and begin to eradicate those. Like, you know, I hope we can do a deeper dive into things like that as a sector. And yet, the backlash, it's really been stunning. I mean, it's, you know, it has become embraced by certain political candidates. Um, it is um, something that things that were really dealt with in tropes in the past are just openly said. Um, it's, it's, it's really quite a period. And I am a big believer that our country... Um, moves forward in fits and starts. Uh, we often take one step backwards and before we take two forwards. But in this space, wow, it really feels to me like we're in that one step back. Tell me a little bit about how you've been seeing that, how you address it, um, both at a national level, but also, you know, in the work that your members do. And David, this was a converse, it's a topic of conversations at two sessions that I remember meeting last week that we are definitely seeing uh, the waning of focus around racial equity and advancing racial equity, but also just blatant racial discriminatory actions taken by elected and, and others. And and I think the, the biggest thing for us is just to continue to double down on our voices around racial equity. So um, within our new strategic framework that was just adopted uh, at our last board meeting, one of the pillars is housing justice and racial equity. And that is us continue to double down on how important it is to uh, advance programs, activities, policies that 
address racial equity, but also speak out and fight against when we see uh, those issues come up, whether it's political within our communities, even within our own space. So, David, I think we're just working to double down on this issue and not be silenced uh, by the, I think, the, the pressures that are saying, let's let's get over this, let's get beyond this, you know, let's let's move forward. And we can't move forward without addressing this these critical issues and just making sure that in every conversation we have, we are advancing these practices of equity and inclusion. Uh, and when again, when we're hearing conversations that are racist, um, that we are speaking out and being the voice to address those issues as well. It's, um, it's both shocking and yet I, you know, was talking to a friend of mine, um, Nikitra Bailey, you may know Nikitra, and we were at a conference together and one of the points she made was that the reason we're experiencing such a big backlash is because we're succeeding. And I thought, mm. wow, that is that is exactly right. If we were failing in this, nobody would feel the need to push back. And And I think we have to really keep that in mind that, you know, if we're going to be successful, people are not going to be happy. Um, and uh, and that's okay. Yeah, David, I love that as a as a sector, in particular this sector, that we are optimistic and that we do recognize and see the advances that we are able to make, and we're not um, discouraged when you know we continue to have to fight the, the same battles that they're they're really critical if we want to make sure that there is justice and equity in our country and our society especially in this space um so it's something that i really do appreciate um about our network and about the the folks who are working in this sector yeah it's um it it is the issue of our time and um, it's, it's so much uh, uh, impacted by it. But uh, another issue of our time is climate. I don't want to leave you without talking about climate, particularly climate impact. You know, for, we spent so many years debating climate change and what can we do about climate change? And I get that. It's important. But climate impact, it's like this is happening now. You, you do not need an imagination. You don't even need a scientist anymore to look around and look at your own life and say, I'm not talking about weather here. I'm talking about the number of hurricanes we see, the number of fires that we see, the number of um, just, you know, you name it, and water issues. Um, we're experiencing this impact. We need to deal with that. Uh, we see it. It comes up in insurance, as, as you know. Um, and you're, you're in California. I mean, it's a, the, there isn't a better place to deal with climate impact because you got it all going on there. Yes. Yes. So tell me a little bit about that. What are you guys doing about that? And, um, and how do you see that both as a national priority and as a, I guess, a human imperative? Mm -hmm. So, so uh, This year, HPN has really been focused on the greenhouse gas reduction funds coming through the EPA. So this is a historic time with significant investment into climate resiliency, and in particular for our sector, the, the, the housing sector. When I think about, when we think about climate change, climate impact, economic justice, we, we think about it within the space of what can we do as developers of affordable housing, lenders in affordable housing, to reduce the carbon footprint of what we do. So we have really been focused on how do we get these resources into the affordable housing sector to affordable housing developments so that 
people who live in the communities where our members work have access to more climate resilient housing. Um, and so we have been working with our members, other national organizations, to come up with a national funding system that will bring those resources down into communities. And we were very excited about joining the Justice Climate Fund uh, application that they submitted to the EPA. The reduction in carbon footprint within the physical built environment could make a significant change in the nation and getting us to more um, for to, to zero decarbonization, you know, with by, I believe, I can't remember, I think it was by, by 2050. Um, so it's a way to address major physical issues within our affordable housing portfolio. And as I said before, ensure that climate resiliency, climate justice is delivered into communities uh, where our members work. And, and, and it should be a surprise to no one that communities that are underserved and underinvested are on the front line of this. Absolutely. And the most impacted in fr and from a, an environmental standpoint. So to be able to turn that around with uh, significant investment that is uh, focused at the community level. And the thing that we really are excited with the Justice Climate Fund, and it is the broad economic development, community development, housing development platform that will hit all of the sectors, but very focused on low and moderate income neighborhoods, disadvantaged communities, communities of color that have been impacted and have experience of, as you know, significant disinvestment. So before we go, I wanted to, um, I, I feel like, you know, I want people to get to know you. I want people to um, get to know all my guests. And one question I heard recently was, um, what's the most interesting and important fact about you that has nothing to do with your work? That's a hard question. <laughs> it is, and I never prepare people for that because I, if it was me, I would prepare a clever answer, but it's like, this is, you know, what, what do I want to know about you that really is like, oh yeah, that is so Robin. Yeah. Um, I, it's, as I think about it, I think it, I mean, I don't know if it's an interesting thing, but I think the thing that makes me who I am uh -huh. and the values that I sit with and the way that I live my life every day is my connection to family. Mm. And um, the influence that my parents had, the values that they set and uh you know they're 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 eight kids um is the person that i am today um and it is that those values that i live by in my personal life but i also bring to my professional life um so i think it's really my appreciation love and commitment to my my broader family uh that most people may not know about me. <laughs> I love that. And I just want to say that podcast listeners, you know, don't see this, but when you said the words commitment to my family, your whole face just lit up. And uh, it's, uh, and that's as real as it gets, isn't it? Thank you. Yes, David, it is. And, you know, as I just talk about it, my, my heart is very warm. So yeah. thank you for asking me that question. What a great way to, to end our chat and to start our next one when we, uh, when we get together, um, which we do periodically. So thank you so much for being here. It's great talking to you, and uh, I hope people really learned as much as I did. Well, David, thank you so much for having me, and I really, really appreciate that you are having your listeners get to know the personal parts of who we are too, because I think that's what makes us much a much stronger network of people working in this space. So thank you so much for having me as a guest. All right, take care. 
Thank you for listening to this edition of Beyond Four Walls. You can visit the National Housing Conference at nhc.org. There you can learn more about affordable housing policies, affordability challenges throughout the nation on our Paycheck to Paycheck database, and explore membership in NHC for you or your organization. We appreciate your interest and look forward to working with you in the future. Until next time, I'm David Dworkin, NHC's President and CEO, wishing you a great day.